There's some things that I want us to be sure that we understand. I thank God for the gentle reminders that he gives along the way. Now, he gave us the call to compel the people to come, but he made each and every one of us our own individual person. He's taking you through every situation in your life to form you and mold you into the person that you are today. Mm -hmm. Now, let me tell you about the forming and molding of Christ. The world will tell you that you are who you once were and that you are a sum of the things of your past and you are bound to the things of your past. But the word says, whom the son sets free is truly free indeed. Why does the world want to keep you bound to your past? Because we all have a unique ability to be fruitful for God's kingdom. But the world wants to do everything that it can to keep you from producing the fruit that is necessary for those that are hungry. How does he do this? So I got a reminder today via social media. Two years ago today, I had a group of friends that were in the ministry and we were sort of together and bouncing ideas and things of that nature. I decided long before accepting this call that I didn't want to do it like everyone else had done it because I had lived a life where the crowds pretended to accept me, but really on the inside, all they wanted to do was tear me apart and keep me away from what I was called to do. So I said when I came into this ministry and I came into this understanding, I was going to, you know, keep focused and do it this way and not be deterred and all these things. But then I found a group of associates and they were seasoned. I was new. So they were trying to push me in a direction which wasn't the direction that I was called to go. Now, how many people understand that in true relationship, you don't always have to agree, but there's a way to correct in love. Amen. There's a way to do things in private that doesn't have to be known publicly. <coughs> Lessons I've had to learn along this journey. I'll tell you, I'll tell everybody, I don't have it all together. And everything that I've learned, I've learned through trial and error. Let me tell you something when it comes to giving access to yourself to other people. We give access to our, of ourselves to other people because we think that sort of like strengthens our core and helps us grow. But when you give access to the wrong people, they know exactly how to stunt your growth because they know the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah, and yeah, what yeah. do people do that have access to you that mean you no good? Mm -hmm. They take the access that they have and they share it with others so that you will reach a ceiling and stop growing while they continue to flourish. So we must be careful because there is a penalty of being fruitless. God has given us all a call. God has given us all a mission. God has given us all an assignment. So you've got the capability to do that which God has called you to do, but don't let those that are giving nutrients into your soil instead of giving you nutrients, they're giving you pesticides that keep you from growing. So today, we talked about compelling the people to come last Sunday, but now this Sunday, I want us to understand that while we're trying to compel the people to come, that we must be careful that we are producing the fruit that we were called to produce. Amen? Amen. Let us stand. Our scripture reading from today is coming from the book of Luke, chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. And the word of God reads as follows. Now there was some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans who, <clears throat> whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all perish. Or these 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Then he told this parable, a man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyards, for three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year 
and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. The penalties of being fruitless. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for the word. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this, the opportunity to come together and share your word, Father, on today, Father. The text has been studied, Heavenly Father, but we're trusting you right now, Father, for a word for these, your children. You know what we stand in need of, Father. You know what opposition we're facing. You know what encouragement we need. You know what correction we need, Father. So we trust you now, Father, that your word will come forth, Father, and do what only it can do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The penalties of being fruitless. We can grow and we can have a great presentation. We can be in the midst of other fig trees that are bearing plenty of fruit. But if we aren't bearing fruit, we're truly worthless to the kingdom. Jesus didn't say, you know, all the other fig trees around this fig tree are making more than enough figs. So we'll leave it and it'll be okay. That fig tree had an assignment to bear fruit. And when we're not bearing fruit, we're so, we, have, we run the chance of the penalty for being fruitless. So we understand there are many parables in the Bible that we read through. And in this particular parable, Jesus is speaking in a pointed and powerful way about God, people, privileges, opportunities, as well as responsibilities. His parables also contain warnings and point out the various perils we face. In the parable of the barren fig, our Lord speaks about the penalty of being useless and fruitless. There is both a national and personal application of this parable, and it can be found in Matthew 21 and 43. And it says, Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to the people who will produce its fruit. you got access, but if you're not producing, he's going to take the kingdom away from us, okay? Jesus is speaking to the nation of Israel, and he is declaring that Israel had one more opportunity to bear fruit to the glory of God. Israel was rejecting the Messiah and God's purpose for them as a nation. Forty years later, the nation of Israel was to disappear as a national entity and to remain so for nearly 1,900 years. Jesus spoke to his nation as he speaks to us in a powerful way through this parable of the unfruitful fig tree. The penalties of not of being fruitless. The first point that I want to leave with you today is that Jesus speaks of God's absolute ownership. We must understand that everything belongs to God. We haven't done anything that entitles us to anything that we have. You know, there's no, you've run the race this long and you've done this, this, and this, so this is your portion. There is no seniority in kingdom building and in the works of the Father. It does not matter that my grandma was running this race for 45 years and then here I go, came on, on the line, and I haven't even done it five years. If you're doing that which you were called to do, you're doing that which he has given you the order to do. And we must understand that he owns all things. God has been and continues to be our creator. The world will want you to believe everything but that. The world will teach you that you are independent, that you are a good thinker, that you are a free thinker, and you have gotten here through your own works and your own merits. But what we must understand is that God was and is and always will be our creator. We have to understand that God has been and he continues to be our repudiated owner. Israel did not see God as the owner and as with a clear title and rights to everything that he accrues because of his ownership. Many people today do not see God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ as the owner of the earth and everything that dwells within it. But how do we know this is true? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness therein. Psalms 24 and 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world, and all who live in it. He has total ownership, and he doesn't share his ownership. That's why it says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Because what he's letting you know, what letting all of us know is you belong 
unto me. You belong. I created you for the assignment that I have called you to do. I don't care what the world tells you you should do. I don't care what your friends tell you you should do. I don't care what your horoscope tells you you should do. You must. Rem we all must remember that he has total ownership of us and we were created to give him all the glory. How much glory does the Father receive when we stand up and say, well, I did it because of my hard work and my independence? That's not pointing back to the Father. How much glory does the Father receive when people see our new homes and we tell them how we fix our credit and we did this, that, and the other? God gets no glory. He is the supreme owner and everything that we have, it is because of him. We must always remember that God has been and continues to be our sustainer. For all practical purposes, contemporary people believe that everything happens because of natural means. You know, I work hard and I got this. You know, I made good decisions and that's why I'm here. I decided to eat healthy and that's why I look like this. We always want to tie it back to something in the natural. But we must understand that not only is God our provider, but he is also our sustainer. Okay, we produce fruit, not because of what we've done, but because of who he is and what he has called us to do. Okay, when we don't give God this honor and this glory, we become an atheist to ourselves. We begin to believe within ourselves that, you know, I, I work hard and work overtime and that's why I got the stuff that I have. You know, I'm independent and I did it by myself and I'm showing people that this is the way. We're not giving God the glory. We're becoming atheists within ourselves. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. So we must be careful of the things that we knowingly and unknowingly speak from our mouths. I've gotten to a point in my life where when someone says anything good to me, I've learned to say God is good. You know, in the beginning, I would want to say, well, you know what? That is true. I study and I do this and I do that. It ain't got nothing to do with that. God is good Amen. because God takes the foolish to confound the wise. I can give you a natural method of how I think things come together. But when I became spiritually mature, I was able to understand the, the answer is simple. God is good. I ain't worthy of it. I don't deserve it. I messed up too much to have it. People will remind you why I shouldn't get it. People will tell you how they think I got it. But the answer always ties back to God is the owner. He has loaned it to me. So God is good. Let God be glorified from the things that he has done because it ain't even about me. I don't want you to look at the things that I possess and you start to think to yourself that I got it going on. I want you to see the things that I possess and I want you to understand that it's because of God's goodness and God's grace. I didn't till the soil to become fruitful, but the Father tilled the soil and gave me the ability to be fruitful. Yes. But what we must understand is we must be fruitful irregardless of those that surround us. But be careful who you allow. To pour into your soil. Amen. Because everybody that says they're giving you fertilizer, yes. they're going to be trying their best to stunt your growth. Amen. You did it by yourself. You know how you retired and got to this point in your life? Because you worked for that. Mm -hmm. You did that. Mm -hmm. You sacrificed. It ain't even about you. About be careful. You. Because that, that fertilizer that they put into the soil, if it's not good for your roots, what's it going to do? It's going to burn out the roots. That's right. And when the plant has no roots, it can't receive nourishment. Oh, Debra, don't you worry about that. And you trying to do this and you trying to do that, you know you ain't gonna make it. You know it ain't gonna work out like that. I don't know why you don't just do this. I don't know why you don't just do that. It's stunting your growth. But when we stay focused on what the Father has called us to do, That's it don't matter what the world tells you, you should produce. Produce that which the Father has called you to and you produce forever. Amen. Because that's the kind of God we serve, the God of exceedingly abundant. Mm -hmm. he, super, he supersedes everything that you need in your life. You want to know why we operate in abundance? Because he wants us to have the ability to produce enough fruit that we can share freely and never have to worry. I think about our neighbors from years ago, Miss Marguerite and Mr. Willie. They planted a garden that was so big it fed more than just their family. It fed the community and whoever asked. They weren't rich in the natural, but they were rich in the spirit because God took the little that they had and allowed that excess to bless their home and the homes around them. So I, now I look back as an adult and say to myself, how 
did they have enough to do this, that, and the other? Because naturally it wouldn't make sense. But then you think about it in the spirit and you realize that God called them and they gave God a yes and God yeah. provided the increase. Yeah, we right. must be fruitful. Mm -hmm. Now imagine if they would have said, well, you know what? This is our income and we have all these children. So let's just plant a quarter of that garden and that will be enough to feed our house. I guarantee you God wouldn't have let that quarter of a garden produce enough even to feed their family. See, God is the kind of God that operates outside of our substance. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. I'm sure they looked at that big garden and they thought to themselves, how are we going to buy all this seed? How are we going to buy all this fertilizer? Who's going to hold it and till it? And who's going to harvest the crops? And who's going to do all these things? But they trusted God and God made a way out of no way. In the heat of summer, Mr. Marguerite would be out there with no shoes on her feet and no hat on her head from sun up to sundown, picking beans and pulling peanuts and pulling corn and doing all these different things. Never got bit by a snake, never got tired, never passed out in fatigue because God made a way. I was yes. a small child, maybe four or five years old, and one day it came to me, I'm going to take Miss Marguerite a glass of water. And my grandma said, anytime you think about that, you go take that water to her. I leave out the air conditioning house and go to the edge of the field and hand her a glass of water. I just thought I was doing something nice as a kid, but now I look back and I say to myself, if she was ever thirsty in her spirit, God made a way out of no way. And just what God did for them is what God wants to do for us. Don't you worry about being fruitful because if you trust the Father, he will allow you to bear fruit. But you cannot worry about what the world has to say. Because those that are around you may tell you the only way, Miss Jeanette, you're going to produce fruit is if you do it this way right here. The only way, Miss Jeanette, that you're going to produce fruit is if you go to this church right here. The only way, Miss Jeanette, you're going to produce fruit is you only associate with these people. That's what the world wants to tell you. But the Father has a blessing for you and those people that the world That's wants to right. turn their back on. The Father ain't going to use you as a well person to bless those that are well. The Father is going to allow you to be fruitful to bless those that are sick. Because if you stay in the confines of the ones that tell you what you must do to be fruitful, you're going to have the leaves and you're going to have the branches, but you ain't going to ever produce the fruit because that's not who the Father called you to be. There is a penalty when we decide to be fruitless. And be careful of your surroundings. Because your surroundings will do their best to keep you fruitless. Mm -hmm. Jesus also speaks of God's right to expect an appropriate return. He is not going to bless you with an ability and not expect a return on that what he has poured into you. Now, when we rent apartments or homes or even building space, we acknowledge who owns the building and we always expect to pay them for the space. Get an apartment and think you ain't going to pay the rent and see what happens. <laughs> Buy a car and think you ain't going to pay the car note and see what happens. Because they will take back what they have entrusted you with. And God has given us all a, a unique gifting. And from that gifting, if we don't use it, God will take it back. Every time when I think about the ability to witness and go forth, I think about little missionary Carly back there and how she likes to share the goodness and the grace of the Lord. And it's an encouragement to me to remember that if she can go forth and speak of God's goodness, I too can speak of God's goodness. Because if we don't give God what he do for God, what he has equipped us to do, he will take it back. Amen. Because God expects an appropriate return. Both Israel and people today have repudiated the rights of the divine owner to receive an appropriate return on his investment. 
because the world tells you, you ain't got to do it that way. You go into church to repent of your sins. All you got to do is take this 12-step program. You were getting up early on Sunday morning. Why they start church at 9 o'clock? They can start church at 12 o'clock. All you got to do is lay in your bed and watch it on the live stream. You want to call, tune in on Monday night if you don't work all day to pray with these people that you can't even see. All you got to do is whisper a prayer in the morning when you get out of bed. Do not allow people to cause you to rob God of a return on his investment. I've said it so many times. God don't move because we can pray so eloquently like Maya Angelou. God don't move because we can sing like Tasha Cobb. God don't move because you can preach like T.D. Jakes. God moves when he sees your sacrifice. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. It costs you something to give God a praise. It will cost you something to be fruitful in this season. It will cost you something to do that which the Father has called you to do. But if you give him the appropriate return, he will bless you for the days that lie ahead. Yes. I'm not telling you what I'm thinking. Yes. I'm telling you what I know. He always makes a way out of no way. He reminds us that there are rivers in the desert. God never expects grapevines to produce watermelons. God never expects corn stalks to bring forth cotton. God never expects apple trees to bear plums. But what God does expect is a return on his investment. You don't have to look like everybody else. You don't have to do it like everybody else. But God expects a return. Be careful of who you let in your circle. You know, sometimes when I first started planting flowers, I used to love to plant them close together because in my mind, you plant them close together and then they're going to grow even bigger because they, you know, they don't have that much that they need to do to get there. But then I realized that appropriate spacing plays a part in how plants grow because if things are too close together, sometimes it'll choke the other plants That's out. Right. You don't need a large circle. You don't need the acceptance of man. God said if two or three are together, that he will be there in the midst. They don't got to know your every move. They don't got to sign off on everything you do. They don't have to understand the dreams and wonders that God is revealing unto you. You want to know why God gives us so many things in our dreams? Because in our sleeping state, we don't even have enough co coercion at that point to question the things that God has called us to do. So he'll give it to you while you are sleeping and let you think it is a dream and really it's the vision that he's called you to. Because if he gave it to you while you were wide awake, your head is going to tell you something different. So he pours it into your spirit while you are sleeping because he understands that we will question and we will do our best to do it our own way. You don't need yes men. You don't need a big crowd. All you need to do is be willing and available. The fertilizer of some other people may stunt the growth of your roots. So trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding, but in all your ways oh, acknowledge yeah. him oh, and yeah. he yes. will direct yes. your path. That's why it's a faith walk because I can't tell you exactly how to get there. I can just point you to the person that can show you the way that you need to go for your life and your situation. Because I may tell you to take 95 he may tell you, you need to go down 17. So don't trust what I tell you. But when you form a relationship with the Father, he'll show you and he'll direct you exactly where you need to go. And sometimes he puts us in this state of isolation so he can have that one-on-one -on -one time with us and he can nourish us and allow us to flourish. Now, when we talk about the fruit that we are to bear, we must understand that the fruit of a Christian is another Christian. How do we know that we are bearing good fruit? Look at those around you that have converted and have come to Christ. Not those that have come to your church. Not those who can only say, Pastor Nick said, and Pastor Nick said. But look around you at those that can say, the word of God says. You know, I saw Sister Deborah, Deborah doing this. And when I, when I saw her doing that, I told her there was something different about what you're doing. And she testified to me about God's goodness. And now I don't want to be Deborah, but I want to do that which she has done. And I want to get a relationship with God so God can do for me exactly what he did for her. See, that's not jealousy right there, but that's compelling 
only one to come into the fold. You see me and you think it's me, but let me tell you what's working within me that has allowed me to produce this fruit. So the fruit of a Christian is another Christian. The fruit of a child of God is another child of God. Jesus was encouraging his nation and he would encourage us to recognize that the Father God is both pleased and glorified when we bring forth much fruit in the, his honor and for his glory. He ain't going to ask you how much you tithe to the church your whole life when you're standing before him in judgment. He's going to want to know how many souls have you compelled to come in? How many people have you told of my goodness and my grace? How many people, strangers, have you helped along the way? He don't care how many times you sung the national anthem. He don't care how many people cried when you led praise and worship. He don't care how many people you can pack into the revival, but how many souls did you compel to change? How much honor and glory did you bring to his name? How do we know this to be true? John 15 and 8 says, this is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. It ain't about us. It's the fruit that we bear, which shows that we are a part of the father. We must also understand that Jesus speaks of a, limita a limitation of divine patience. How many understand that God is patient with us? How many times have we sung the song, please be patient with me, God isn't through with me yet. But do we still, in the midst of that, understand that his patience will run out? He's not going to wait forever. Luke 13 and 7 said, So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? There can be a call on your life. And there is a call on your life. And there is an assignment that you were set forth to do. But if you take too long to do it, he will pluck you up and allow something else to grow in that soil. Because his patience runs out. God is not in the business of encouraging parasites who use up space that could be occupied by productive plants. What is the purpose of a disease and a virus? A virus's purpose is to get inside something that is well, attach itself to that thing, and take away the nutrients from the body. What happens when we get a virus? We get sick. Our immune system gets weak. We get a stuffy nose, and we get a flu, and we get COVID, and we get all these things because it's working against our bodies. But when we stay healthy, we don't get these viruses, and we're able to do the work of the Father. When we are sick, we are of no good to ourselves, so we're definitely of no good use to anyone around us. Don't let God's patience run out with you. You'll never truly understand how to do everything he's called you to do. That's why it's a faith move, because when it doesn't make sense, we lean on him and we trust him, and he makes ways out of no way. Do not allow his patience to run out. God wants to replace the parasites with those that will be productive. The national application of this parable is that God's patience with the nation can be exhausted. Look around us. People will believe everything but the word of God. Look around us. There's leaders popping up from every corner. Look around you. There's a church that you can find or even an organization, don't even call itself a church, that allows any and everything. Do not allow God's patience to run out with you. The personal application is that God's patience with the rebellious, unfruitful individual has been blessed with God's favor so that we <coughs> never reach the point of exhaustion. We weren't worthy to produce the fruit. It wasn't nothing so great that we had done. But God gave us the opportunity to show us that he can use anyone. But when he decides to use you, if you're not ready to give him the honor and the glory and produce the fruit he's called you to, he will pluck you up and allow something else to be planted in the soil. Never allow God's patience to run out with your life. Jesus speaks of the gospel of a second chance. Luke 13 and 8 through 9. Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. The gospel of a second chance. 
We were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. We were never worthy of the sacrifice that was paid on our behalf. But the gospel of the second chance gave us the opportunity to come into the fold and to be fruitful. When we look back and evaluate our performance, we have to admit that we've had periods in our lives where we have not been fruitful. When we look back at our performance, we have to admit that we've, got, we've had a season where the plant and the bush looked good, but there was no fruit coming forward from it. How many times have you gone to the store in the summer and you bought that bag of peanuts and you get home and you sit down to eat your peanuts and it's a big shell and you pop the shell open and there's nothing in the shell but salty water? It looked like a peanut. You were prepared for peanuts. Your stomach was ready for peanuts, but there was no peanut in the shell. We all have had the season of false peanuts where we look like a Christian. You know, we talk like a Christian. We went to church like Christians. We paid our tithes like Christians, but there was nothing being produced from us to prove to the world that we were Christians. So we have to evaluate our performance. Okay. And when we realize that we have not been productive, we have to make a change so that when the father returns, he will find figs on our tree. Okay? So what we always have to remember is that some opportunities from the past will make us feel that it's impossible for us to produce the fruit. But when we are in the father's vineyard, when we are called according to his purpose, he takes the foolish and he confounds the wise. People may tell you that this type of pear tree can't produce pears in South Carolina, but if the father plants that pear tree, it will produce those pears because there is someone or something that's in need of that product. So the father plants and the father allows increase. Never worry that you are ill-equipped. Never worry that your past will shut you out. Never worry that no one is going to listen to you because he is the God of a second chance. We have some decisions that we have to make today. Let us decide not only to read God's word, but to take heed to God's word. You want to find direction? You want to know what you need to do? Don't ask your neighbor. Don't, don't ask your friends. Read God's word. God's word is our blueprint to salvation. Everything that we need, we will find in the word. But don't just read the word, but heed the word. Take the encouragement from the word, but also take the correction that comes along with it as well. Let us also see that prayer is something more than a fire escape or a parachute. We can't just pray when we're in trouble and want God to give us a way out. God, if you turn this around, I'm going to do this. God, if you make a way out of no way, I'm going to do that. God, if you deliver me from this one more time, I'm going to do this. Prayer is not just our fire escape or our parachute. We must understand that prayer is the thing that we do so that we can commune with the Father and he can give us direction, he can give us correction, and he can give us instruction through prayer, and through relationship. Let us recognize that the church is more than a place. Amen? The church is definitely more than just a place. Let us see it as the body of Christ in the world today through which he carries out his work for the world. The church ain't just a place that we come on Sunday morning because that's what we've been taught to do our whole life. The church is the place that we come to get a recharge for the week that lies ahead. The church is the place that we come so that we can fellowship together with the saints. The church is the place that we come so we can feel the move of the Spirit. The church is the place that we come because it equips us for everything that's waiting on the other side of that door. It's more than just a building. Let us not neglect or ignore the Holy Spirit. Let us respond to him positively as he creates within us a hunger for fellowship with God and as he lays on us the bless, blessings of a burden of compassionate concern for those around us. Let us not neglect the Holy Spirit. Now, as I started off talking today about that group that I was no longer a part of and all the things that the group did to hurt me, sometimes we have to realize 
that the situation of our enemies is what God uses to catapult us into our destiny and that which he has called mm -hmm. us to do. Mm -hmm. But the reason that we get to that point, because self would say, well, see, I'm, I'm making it by myself. So let me tell y'all who they are and what they did. But the Holy Spirit says you couldn't be fruitful in that circle. So we cast you out of that circle so that you can be fruitful and do that which God has called you to do. But the only way that I saw that is because I chose not to neglect the Holy Spirit. If I resided in self, it would have been a whole lot different Amen. today, two years later. Yes. But I relied yes. on the Father, and the Father makes a way out of no way. Another thing for us to remember, let us seize every opportunity for self-improvement through study and training. Everybody talks about church hurt today. I, we hear it all the time, and I'm not speaking against anyone that says they've experienced church hurt, but what I will say to anyone that has experienced church hurt, we've gone to stores and wanted clothing and they told us it wasn't in our size or we tried it on, they told us it didn't look good on us. We've heard designers make comments about black people buying their stuff, but I've never heard of Louis Vuitton hurt. I've never heard of red bottom hurt. I've never heard of Mercedes Benz hurt, but all I hear about is church hurt Church hurt. Church hurt. Is the church the only place that's hurting people? I, I, didn't, I don't think so. But we'll return and frequent those places and give them our hard-earned money, but then we'll tell everybody, cancel church, because the pastor said this, that, and the other. Let us get to the place where we take every opportunity. And I'm not saying that every pastor does things in a way that is acceptable. What I am saying is, as we grow in relationship, we'll learn what to chew up and we'll learn what to spit out and we'll learn when to move elsewhere and we'll learn when to be in submission. We will learn these things through relationship, but always seize the opportunity for self-improvement. One of my prayers daily is, Father, push me to the place where I'm uncomfortable, but always allow me to hear your voice and have your direction. I don't have it all together. I make mistakes. I don't understand it all, but I know about God's grace. And I've come to a relationship with him and every opportunity for self-improvement through study and training, I will study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, when we become more competent in the church, we'll be able to see how it all comes together and how it all works. Just because they didn't choose you to be the praise team leader, that doesn't mean that you still can't sing praises unto the Father. Just because they didn't choose you to be the assistant pastor, that doesn't mean that your life living can't be a testimony to win souls and bring them over. Sometimes the denial of an opportunity, sometimes not being accepted in the click is the thing that was needed to push us to the place to do that which the Father has called us to do. Don't be afraid to produce your fruit on the side by yourself because if you are called according to the Father, you can produce fruit on the west side just like they produce fruit on the east side because the father will give you the nutrients that are necessary everything is not going to feel good when it comes to self-correction everything is not going to make us want to hold our chest out and be proud about it but everything will mold us into who we need to be for those that are coming along that have suffered what we've suffered and are seeking direction the dangers of being fruitless. Stand with me. Now as we venture through the remainder of this day, as we venture through the week that lies ahead, one thing I've learned is if we preach about it on Sunday, the devil is going to test us in it on Monday. So be ready for the test that is coming. And remember, there is a penalty for being fruitless. I don't care how comfortable you feel in a situation right now when that soft voice speaks to you and tells you it's time to move on and do something different, move so that you can be fruitful. I don't care how comfortable you are right now with status quo and just getting by. When the Father pushes you to do something better, move forward. Don't allow him to return and we have been fruitless and we have not produced the fruit that he's called us to. Amen.